I'd like to start by thanking Desert, and Bill, and Kate, and Doug for organizing this and inviting us. Appreciate the opportunity. And of course, all of you for coming out. I, too, am surprised by the turnout. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, this was going to be a panel discussion with myself, my coworkers, Melanie Medeiros, and Brandon Gobbler. But as we got closer to it, I kind of thought it made more sense for me to do all the talking. I absolutely love public speaking, <laughs> and I'm grateful for this. And really, I was, um, I was in the field every day on the project, and these two both know a lot about it, and they'll be able to chime in on some questions, but uh, well, I just thought I'd do it. I also want to acknowledge Ian Milliken over here. He was in the field with us almost the whole time digging features. So I'm going to talk about the Marsh Station Road site. This is a poster we put together that you can take a look at if you want. Um, it's a site we dug about three years ago. We dug just a portion of it. It flies. It's about 25 or 30 miles southeast of Tucson, just off of I-10 as you go toward Benson. Uh, it's located at the confluence of Cienega Creek and Mescal Wash. Uh, that fact alone, I think, would make it pretty appealing for people, prehistoric people, to spend some time there. But that's probably not the only reason. It's, it's kind of located on the fringe of the Sonoran Desert, but with ready access to everything the Sonoran Desert offers. It's not far from Chihuahuan Desert and grasslands up Cienega Creek, nor from the... Um, so, southern slope of the Rincon Mountains. So anybody who was spending time there could have hypothetically had access to any number of resources and resource zones. Also, as the name Cienega Creek might suggest, much of the length of Cienega Creek through much of prehistory was indeed a Cienega, and of course that would be awfully appealing to people in a rather arid environment. Um, we certainly weren't the first people to do work out there. Uh, there were some sites further up Cienega Creek to the south that had been excavated, uh, at least portions of them excavated decades before, and then again more recently. Um, sites like the Donaldson site and Los Ojitos, both early agricultural period sites. And more recently, um, archaeologists with statistical research here in town excavated a portion of the Mescal Wash site, which is also at the confluence of Cienega Creek and Mescal Wash, but just across Mescal Wash from where we were. If the wash weren't there, I'm sure we would just think of it as one site. So all that work gave us an idea of what we might expect to find. And some of our exp expectations were met, some were not. So I'm just going to go through chronologically what we found um, and then try to situate those occupations a little bit with what is generally known about the Tucson Basin. Not all of you can see the title of that poster, but it says 2,500 years in the marsh, and we had about 2,500 years of uh, documented occupation out there. It started in the early agricultural period and went right up to latest prehistory. It wasn't steady that whole time. There was denser and then less dense occupations as time went. Uh, the early agricultural period dates from 2100 BC to AD 50 right now. The first 900 years of that are not too well known and in fact presently referred to as the unnamed phase of the early agricultural period. <laughs> and that's how I'll go ahead and refer to it, is as the unnamed phase. Somebody soon probably will find something really cool and then we'll know what to call that phase, but it hasn't happened yet. We probably don't have much evidence of an occupation during that phase. We had uh, one projectile point of a style called gypsum that may date to that time. It could date a little bit earlier. It could date a little bit later. Uh, but it was not in a context where we can say much about it. Coming forward in time, we had a whole bunch of 
what are called Cortaro points, and those are just bifaces with concave bases, really. Any biface with a concave base around here is called a Cortaro point. And that subsumes a whole variety of morphological variation, well, yeah, and probably some temporal variation also. As other people have noticed, some Cortaro points are really thin, well napped, probably served as projectile points. Others are quite big and chunky and ugly and probably weren't projectile points. <laughs> we had some of both. Um, some of those, I, th I think I said, may well be of the unnamed phase, but they've actually been used as diagnostic of earlier time periods by some people. Well, I think most people would agree that they were made throughout the early agricultural period and perhaps even into more recent prehistory by people like the Hohokam. So they're suggestive, but it's hard to say. Beyond that, uh, the next phase of the early agricultural period is the San Pedro phase. That dates from 1200 to 800 BC. And we have a pretty solid evidence of that occupation. Um, projectile points among them. A whole bunch of projectile points of the San Pedro style, which itself subsumes some variation. Um, for example, the width of the neck of some of these projectile points varies quite a bit, and some of them look more like points that are known from up around the four corners. Um, some seem to be more classic Tucson Basin types. Aside from, from those, we had some other San Pedro phase points, probably one called Tyrene, and I don't think they've been published much yet, although Jane Sleva with Desert has, uh, she told me about them in person at first, and I know she's uh, written up something in a supplemental issue of uh, Archaeology Southwest. That'd be one place to look if you wanted to see them, but I don't know that they're out anywhere else yet. And then another point type called Empire. Uh, they're probably all San Pedro phase, but whether they're truly contemporaneous, it's hard to say. We also had some radiocarbon dated maize from the San Pedro phase, which of course is a pretty solid indicator. We had one on a, on a cob that's got, there's a photograph of it up here, and another one on a charred maize cupule. And they both came back around 1000 BC, uh, not quite, but solid San Pedro phase. They were both also recovered in different extramural features with San Pedro points. Uh, the features were quite different. One was a big bell pit, looked like it had been first excavated and used as a roasting pit and then cleaned out and used, uh, well, maybe at one point for storage, but when we excavated, it looked like it had just been trash filled. The other feature looked nothing like that, no evidence of burning, three large stones in the base of it. I don't really know what it was for. Uh, let's see, other evidence of the San Pedro phase. We had a whole, we had about 35 other features that were, we thought possibly of the San Pedro phase for one reason or another. One reason being that they were located near the two that definitely were. Another reason being that they contained San Pedro or other San Pedro phase projectile points. And third, because they were largely aceramic. And I wouldn't want to carry that argument too far because a feature can be without ceramics for any number of reasons, but possibly. I, I doubt that we had maize that we could date in the only two San Pedro phase features out there. There were probably more. We just can't be too sure. We had one structure that I think maybe was early agricultural, largely because it shares some morphological similarities with structures that are known to be early agricultural from sites along the river here in Tucson. Uh, specifically, an informal, well, plan view shape looked like um, an informal hearth, certainly not like a hohokam, stereotypical hohokam hearth. And then also a big storage pit in the floor. Uh, I found some illustrations in the desert report from Las Capas um, that, that uh, the, the houses weren't from Las Capas that I'm talking about, but uh, I think 
Solar Well and Santa Cruz Bend both had houses that looked like this one. So again, it's just suggestive. I can't say for sure, but I like to think it's early agricultural. Lastly, we had one inhumation that was covered with stones, and there are what are called cairn burials known from San Pedro phase contexts. Those, to my knowledge, uh, have, are flexed burials, and this individual was not. He was laid out, and I don't, I don't know if that necessarily means that he was not early agricultural or not. Uh, I think that's about it for the San Pedro phase. Going forward from there, you have the Cienega phase, which dates from 800 BC to AD 50, and we didn't have much from there. We had one, one type of, there's a few different types of Cienega phase projectile points. We had just one of those, although San Pedro points could have been manufactured into the Cienega phase, so we might have a a more significant Sienic phase op occupation than we could actually determine. It stays pretty thin moving into the early formative. Uh, what we were calling the early formative out here would be like the Agua Caliente and Tortolita here in Tucson. I think we had two dates, one of which was kind of sketchy and uh, out of context that weren't too um, solid either. But then as you get to the middle formative and the late middle formative, what is called the sedentary period here in Tucson and in Phoenix, we again have a, a pretty dense occupation. Um, I think eight or 10,000 sherds, most of which came from that time. Ground stone, faunal bone, shell, um, and a whole bunch of features, most of them extramural pits, but also some structures. Uh, I think what's most interesting about the structures was the, the variation we had in them. And we only had, I think, five. None of, none of them looked like each other. And none of them looked like what I knew as a stereotypical sedentary period hohokam house, which is to say a sub-rectangular pitch structure nicely plastered with an entryway you know, in the center of the long wall and the hearth right behind that. We had uh, one, for example, it was more circular, and it was a house in a pit. So you had, you had the superstructure held up by a bunch of posts on the perimeter that were inside the pit, and then one, one post supporting all of that. Not well, it, it didn't look like a lot of effort had been put into making it. There was no plaster. The hearth wasn't much shake a stick at. But another one right next to it, was sub-rectangular and had plaster, plaster on the walls, plaster floor, nice hearth, and it was supported by eight post holes you know, in two rows of four. Really looked quite a bit different than the first one I mentioned, but they were back to back and both aligned to magnetic north. They didn't overlap at all, but just abutted, and I couldn't help but wonder if one of those houses existed still, at least in some shape, when the other one was constructed. It's easy to start guessing too much, but perhaps one set of builders knew about the other house. Could just be chance, of course. Uh, let's see, what else in the middle formative? Hmm? I think that's about it. Huh? Most of the artifacts. Yeah. Most of the sherds. I'll come back to them when I try to situate this stuff a little bit. But moving forward in time past that sedentary period is the classic period, and we basically had no evidence of it. We had one reconstructable vessel that we think is probably late classic, and that's it. Um, So that's what we had to try to situate that stuff a little bit. I, I'm really only going to talk about the early agricultural period and the middle formative, since those were the densest two occupations we had. I think a handy way to try to talk about the early agricultural period is by referencing a model uh, put forth by Jonathan Mabry who used to work for Desert and now works for the city of Tucson. I, I can't remember what he calls the model. 
I've been calling it the niche filling model, and that might be what he call it, calls it, or he might not call it anything at all. Yeah, yeah, nice one. <laughs> he, um, he argues that different locations on the landscape would have been settled in sort of order as to the ease with which corn could have been grown at those, those locations. And I'm talking early agricultural period here. Uh, these folks probably would, at least at the beginning, have wanted to use safe techniques in safe places that didn't require too much labor on their part to grow maize. So the technique that would require the least amount of effort, be less risky, and still be productive would probably be water table farming. I suppose that's self-explanatory, but you'd find a place where the water table was high and put some seeds there, and you wouldn't really have to do much. You could come back later, maybe, and have maize ready for you. On the opposite end of the spectrum would be irrigation agriculture, where you have to invest quite a bit in labor, building your canals, planting your fields, maintaining head gates, and then you have to hope that you get enough rain but not too much rain. Um, you don't get enough and your head gates are high and dry and you get too much and everything gets flooded and you're back to the drawing board. Um, so a place you would think like the site I'm talking about would have been one of the first places occupied by early agricultural farmers. It was a Cienega environment, water tables right there. It seems like it would be pretty appealing. And certainly places like those existed in Tucson, or on the Santa Cruz near Tucson, and other places in Cienega Valley and elsewhere. But you'd think that's where the earliest stuff would be, and I guess I'll, well, we didn't find evidence of that earliest stuff necessarily. Those Cortaro points I talked about may be indicative of an occupation in the un unnamed phase or even earlier, but like I've said, it's just we can't tell for sure. I think places like the Marsh Station road site, ro road site or the adjacent Mescal Wash site are good places to look, if only because there's been so much stuff that happened later in Tucson and not just with you know, during the historic and into the present times, but even the prehistoric occupation was quite a bit denser here than it was in Cienega Creek Valley, for example, and may have obscured traces of those earliest farmers here more so than there. I'm sure they're out there. You know, we just excavated a sliver of the site, like I said, and, and probably just didn't have the opportunity to see them. Well, with regard to the mill formative, the, uh, the work at Statistical, they talked about this area being in sort of a frontier zone, a hinterland between major cultural manifestations, the one in the Tucson Basin being the Hohokam. There's this other debated, lesser known cultural manifestation called Dragoon which two of its defining characteristics are a type of ceramic, a type of decorated ceramic, and at least one architectural feature called a recessed hearth, which is basically just kind of a sunken hearth in a pit house. They're very distinctive when you see them. And we didn't. Statistical did. They certainly exist out there. But we, our ceramics were almost all Hohokam, none of this Dragoon stuff a couple black on white sherds from the mountains to the east, I think one sherd from southwest, a couple from the Phoenix Basin, but almost all Tucson Basin Hohokam stuff. So lacking those Dragoon ceramics and the um, architectural characteristics suggestive of the Dragoon folk, uh, it looks to us like it was Tucson Basin Hohokam out there. I certainly don't mean to say that statistical was wrong, because I've seen pictures and they definitely had this stuff. 
It's just that we either dug a portion of the site that was earlier or later occupied by Hohokam, or perhaps there were multiple groups living out there at the same time. I kind of like the idea of that just because of that little bit of evidence we had in the early agricultural period of these different but large, you know, broadly contemporaneous point styles. Um, it seems like for probably 2,500 years that different people from different places have been out there using that environment, that location for any number of reasons. I think that's really all I had. I think I did that a lot faster live than I had in uh, <laughs> mocks. So hopefully I said some things that make somebody say no way or that's interesting and there'll be some comments or questions. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open the floor to questions. You use the term hinterland. Um, and that's kind of a loaded term. Uh, how would this have been a hinterland, hinterland in the sense that I understand it as a, a kind of supplier of natural resources or agricultural products or something to, to a primary site, to a, a prime site? There was uh, this paper that I referenced is in a book that has hinterlands in the title. You guys? It's uh, by Sullivan and Bayman. It's a collection it's of papers, and it's uh, hinterlands and something. So I can't remember. 2007. I'm sure they define exactly what they mean by hinterland, and I couldn't tell you that definition off the top of my head, although I don't remember that there was any sort of connotation of peripheral areas supplying core areas, but rather that there were just these sort of vague areas between more visible and better defined culture areas that archaeologists have identified. Phoenix Basin, Hohokam, Tucson Basin, Hohokam, Mogollon to the east, for example, Casas Grandes down south of us, um, which I think is loaded in a different way maybe than what you're talking about. It's still, just because maybe we haven't built cities in those areas. We haven't done as much work out there and haven't seen as much. Certainly there were people living out there. We've seen it. Statistical has seen it. There's surveys up and down Cienega Creek and there's lots of stuff out there. It's just not as well known and therefore a hinterland to us. One sec. Okay. Um, just curious about the elevation of the site. It's uh, definitely higher than here. I think it's right about 3,400. Yeah? Just Sound right? we're working on. Oh. Yeah. 40 feet above the creek. Yeah, now there is some relief there. I don't know that it would have been that way before all the overgrazing and downcutting. But even within the portion of the site we excavated, there's quite a bit of relief from Holocene terraces to a couple different Pleistocene terraces. And also, uh, there's evidence that the site was flooded at different times during um, the prehistoric period. Uh, most of the evidence comes from metaformative period features, but there's no way we can really say that it was only flooded during the metaformative a couple of times. Um, but there's definitely um, faunal evidence and um, shell evidence and depositional evidence that Seneca Creek or, and or Mariscal Wash came up into the site at different periods of time and receded. So um, it wasn't that far off from the water. Question over here. You talked about sh uh, black and white sherds from the east. Are you talking Mimbury's Classic? Where are we? Ah. Um, yeah, that's right, isn't it? You remember? There, there's eight membrous black and white shirts. We couldn't identify them to type. They were too degraded and too small. They were just definitely membrous black and white, and that's about all we could get from them. Neat. So not too much evidence. Okay. 
I'd be curious um, for each of you to say what, that you, what you found that was the most exciting find for each of you and why. Dog burial. <laughs> <laughs> Take the mic on this. <laughs> I'm done. That's it. <laughs> Ian dug a, a feature, a big pit that had uh, pieces of a, a red on brown. Was it a plate? Yeah. yeah. Big, big plate. And also a disarticulated dog or coyote in there. So that was his. Mine. Oh. Michael just went around finding all the cool stuff. So <laughs> if someone raised their hand, he'd come and he'd pull it out and be like, oh, look what I found. <laughs> it's my prerogative. <laughs> I think the most exciting thing, the guy who dug this pit that we have illustrated in the center here, he, he was all black and blue from digging it. Uh, from, you know, dark soil, not that he was... <laughs> but he came with uh, his hand kind of clenched like this and opened it up and said, is this a corn cob? He knew it was, but it was neat to see. I'd never seen anything like that. And we thought that was pretty neat in the field and still. <laughs> uh, Melanie was in the field for... Two days. Two days. I had foot surgery. It prevented me from digging. <laughs> and Brandon wasn't in the field on that project, so... <laughs> The stories of what I found would bore you. <laughs> yeah, he did a lot of statistical analyses. And, yeah. It's old. <laughs> True. Uh, not everything that we find can be radiocarbon dated or dated to such a fine resolution, so it's neat to know that you can find a shirt and you know it's probably from 900 AD to 1100 AD, but it just doesn't have the same effect as something that can be precisely dated, I think. Plus, early corn, there's getting to be more and more examples around Tucson and um, corn that dates to 1100 or 1000 BC is not major news now, but it's still is pretty neat and expands the picture a little bit. There had been corn of this age from sites not too far away, so it wasn't surprising, just neat. How often do you get to hold a 3,000-year-old piece of corn in your hand? <laughs> Once. So far. Sherry? I'm an Arizona site steward, and that's um, one of the areas that we monitor. And we'd stopped in quite frequently when your dig was going on. And I'm not exactly sure what portion you're talking about. Um, there was one feature, and I don't know if this was on your dig or not, that was absolutely astounding, and that was a central fire pit and around it, and I can't remember if there were five or six small, um, look like rings that held bowls, but were charcoaled. Was that on your loci? No. Nope. That was not yours. That was, that was, that was what? Yeah, it was either WCRM who did work on this site before we did. They worked up. Well, you know it. If you're coming off the paved road and right. you turn, there's just a little dirt pullout. They right. worked up there. But well, I don't, they had several areas. I think, I yeah. think you're probably talking statistical at no. the Mescal wash site. No, no, no. no. Then I don't uh, uh, know. No, this was at the Mescal. I mean, I, it was absolutely unbelievable uh, feature. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'm going to learn more about it and start claiming it as ours. <laughs> We have a couple of questions from the crowd already. Um, what does Cienega mean in Spanish? Swamp, marsh. Yeah, we're right there off Marsh Station Road, which is why we named the site, and right off Cienega Creek. So while you can't tell so much now, at one point it was pretty wet. And there is still some water in portions of Cienega Creek. Um, someone probably has some inside knowledge on this question, but in monsoon science times, why is the area called Marsh Station? In monsoon times? Monsoon times? Or is it modern times? <laughs> I really need to wear glasses. In modern times, why is it called Marsh Station? I don't know the 
etymology of that, I bet it's in that Barnes, Arizona place names, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was still pretty wet when that was coined maybe 130 years ago, but I don't know. And uh, could you t speak a little bit about the pipeline and road construction and how it impacts the excavation? Yeah, I could speak a fair bit about that. <laughs> The pipeline's going through the site, that's why we were there. This was one of five or six sites we did data recovery on, but it was the, the neatest one. Uh, the pipeline tries to disturb as little earth as possible, and that limits what we are allowed to look at also. Um, yeah, you could maybe swing through here. Um, when we did the survey f before we started data recovery, I think we surveyed a 250 foot wide survey corridor. And we dug, we, it kind of changed as we were out there. At one point, the construction people thought that they would use this area as a turnaround for their trucks. And so it was going to be a bigger area that was going to be impacted than ultimately was impacted. But while it was going to be that big area, we surface collected a pretty good chunk of the site. And so we have all these artifacts that don't necessarily overlay where we ended up excavating. We excavated maybe 20 meters. No, probably not even that. Probably like 12 meters either side of the pipeline. There's uh, two other pipelines that go through right there, too, and that limited our excavations also. We couldn't get closer than about 10 feet to those for obvious reasons. Sure. On the, uh, the burial that you found, you said that was associated with uh, early agriculture? I said it was, but I, I wouldn't want to be held to that. I said it, it could be. And I only say it could be because of all the rocks that were on top of it. That might be indicative of burials from other periods, but I don't know that to be true. Well, isn't the inhumation the way that uh, it's a Hohokam site, correct? This site? Yes. There is a Hohokam component to this site. Okay. Do you think it's Mogian? Um, it could be. I couldn't say it wouldn't. You know, we had very well, little material. Well, the question, what comes up, it, isn't that an unusual burial? And it's a spine position instead of a flexed. It was unusual to me. I don't know that it's unusual for an early agricultural period inhumation from the Tucson Basin, but it's certainly not like any Hohokam inhumation I had ever seen. So maybe it's early agricultural. Maybe it's something different. Mogion. I don't know. There were no, there was nothing in it as far as uh, burial offerings or grave goods, so. Did you encounter any evidence of um, any sort of Apache occupation at all? No. Uh, and actually, I, I think there's some uh, Apache burials that have cairns over top of them. Uh, I remember thinking that at one point that maybe that's what this was. No, I, I think other people have recorded possible early historic subipery or Apache occupations out there, but we didn't see anything like that. I've always been kind of curious about um, early agricultural food other than corn. Did you see any evidence for any other foodstuffs? No. Uh, pollen was quinoams and some cacti, some cattail. There was no maize pollen with any of the early agricultural features that we had. Mm -hmm. So well, I can't help but think they were growing corn out there, if only because Mabry's model predicts it and it makes sense to me. But it doesn't, it doesn't hold up well, and it wouldn't be too much of a stretch that there was maize grown out there and we just didn't find it. The cob that we had could have been brought from elsewhere. It could have even been used as fuel in that roasting pit and not entirely cleaned out. Any other questions? Here you go. Uh, 
No amaranth? There's amaranth out there growing now. You're not talking about the Ameren Foundation. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, yes. Kino Am, uh, what's Kino? Kino Podium? And Amaranth, it just gets hyphenated as Kino Am, and we did have Kino Am out there. Yeah, we did not have any evidence of agave. And um, yeah, I mean, it's mezcal wash and the mezcal wash site, but just no mezcal that we saw. <laughs> Questions going once? Twice? All right. Um, well, if we'll have, a, just, I guess, a little bit of a shorter session tonight, and uh, thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate uh, the, the talk, and uh, we have a great lineup scheduled for the rest of the season. Um, all of you that are on our mailing list will be getting postcards in the mail with our entire upcoming Archaeology Cafe season. Um, on your way out, uh, take your time. Feel free to, to enjoy yourselves. Definitely stop by and take a look at the poster. It really puts a lot of this stuff into visual context. Um, it certainly helped me just being able to stand here and look at it. And uh, I thank you all again for coming out. I really appreciate your support. One more thing. I don't want to interrupt the applause. <laughs> <laughs> we have a box of brochures up here that talk about this site also. Feel free to take Neat. one of them. And if it's not out of line, I hope it's not, I'd like to plug this month's speaker for the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society. Ray Thompson will be speaking. If you've seen him, you know, and if you haven't, he's a great speaker and tells great stories. So that's Monday the 20th. Thank you. Thanks.